Wow, last, uh, this past Sunday, you guys were rocking, and uh, I, I just sense that the staging up of what God is doing, um, <clears throat> praise precedes great things. Praise precedes great things. And the higher our praise goes, it's almost like prophecy. The higher we praise, it's like prophesying over our lives, breakthroughs, uh, provision, intervention of God. So our praise is leading the way. You know, uh, when God was, was going to uh, do things in the Bible, he sent the praisers out in front. Think about it. He's got a battle. I mean, they got swords and all this weaponry. And God's saying, all right, you guys just step down. All right, let's get the praisers up here. And this is how he instructed the prophet of God. Put the praisers up front because we want victory. He says, not by might or by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. See, God is attracted to praise. And we start to praise the Lord. When it comes out of our heart, genuine and authentic, he's attracted to it. He wants to be near it. He wants to be around it. Isn't that awesome? So he sent the praisers out in front so that the battle could be guaranteed. That's awesome. I thank God for that. So, um, you know, all day long today, I've been just blasting down every stronghold, just going after it. In fact, in my house today, uh, we took some time, and actually, you know how you got spots in your house, there's clutter, or there's something here or there, and you're kind of like, you're kind of like, well, maybe we'll do that next week, and maybe next year. <laughs> yeah, and you got those little, I call them strongholds in the house, you know, <laughs> and it's like, well, today we busted strongholds. You know, the natural comes first, and then the spiritual. That's what the Bible says, 1 Corinthians 15. First comes the natural, then comes the spiritual. Sometimes if you want to break through in the, natu- or in the spirit realm, start dealing with things in the natural realm. In other words, you're, like they were saying, if you're complaining, start praising. The natural's got to change. You've got to begin to introduce to your world the fact that your God is above your problems. Yeah. Yeah, he's able. Praise the Lord. Well, we release the kids right now to their class, and uh, see you back here in a little bit. Uh, today, I didn't even put a title on this today because I uh, because I, I just it's so spiritual in nature. You know, I just can't even seem to title it. I just know it's dealing with demons. Dealing with demons. Uh, I want you to know uh, something right before I start to minister this word that um, Marge and I, last Wednesday, were up in Syracuse, New York, and we were actually on Skinny Atlas Lake. There's a beach house or a, a lake house there about midway up on the western shore, and uh, they had a bunch of pastors gathering there. That sounded like an invitation we couldn't turn down. <laughs> so we went there to really to make connections, to meet people, and to do such things as that. And uh, what we did, we made some really um, good connections with some pastors from the Syracuse area, some ministers from Oklahoma that we were furthering our relationship with. And um, <clears throat> even uh, the lady and her husband who owned the home there, are, they're like ministers who they accommodate ministers coming and they set up venues for ministers to come and minister to the preachers, to minister to the pastors. And so they, they feel like they're a refreshing station for ministry. And um, uh, so a couple things happened. One is we made connections, but the other thing is that she's invited uh, me to come up and minister there at the house to ministers. And then also uh, her and her husband and a minister and his wife that we met are coming down. I think they're coming next Sunday. And, but they want to come down and see what God's doing and just get the heartbeat of what God is saying in this house. They can feel it, and they, so they're going to come. Isn't that exciting? To, I love the connection in the body of Christ. I love uh, cross-pollination and seeing what the Lord will do. God has big plans for us. Um, does anybody think God has small plans for us? No. God has uh, big plans for us. And so we got your Bibles. You can turn to 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 10. I'm going to talk to you out of a very familiar piece of Scripture and um, as you're on your way there, remember um, <clears throat> that next week's Thanksgiving, right? No, or is it the week after? Yeah. Is it late this year? Yeah, yeah it's actually, I think I written down. Yeah, well, that Thanksgiving 
uh, the day before Thanksgiving is a Wednesday night, so that'd be two weeks from now, right? Uh, that, we're not going to have a service that night. Don't forget that so that you're not here and uh, think we're going to be here. We're busy cooking pies. <laughs> so we want you to enjoy your family. We've actually particularly picked a few different services to uh, give space for people to spend time with their families. I know that you're very committed people, and we want you to have time. Oh, by the way, I want to say hi, Renee. Good to see you. It's my niece, Bob's daughter. Nice to see you, Renee. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. I suppose I'm the only one not there. Can we pray? Father, we just want to thank you right now for your word. It is divine instruction. It is actually the total solution for everything we face. And Lord, help us to not look outside of the truth. Help us to focus on these truths, to show us how to implement them in our lives, how to, how to embrace truth in our lives, and how to reject the lie from the enemy. Father, I just ask you to reveal the truth about what we face in the spirit realm yes. so that we will be armed with the wisdom of God yes. even if our eyes can't see it or our ears can't hear it. We'll know it to be true because your word declares that there are angels and there are demons. There is a, a real realm of darkness and a real realm of light. And yes. Father, we confess now that we've been born of the light yes. and we are children of the light. Yes. We're children of the kingdom, children of wisdom, children of God. And so, Lord, uh, feed us tonight out of that wisdom so that we'll be wise and successful in this life. Amen. Amen. All right. So, um, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, <clears throat> if you read with me, um, it says in verse 3, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. So, I would just stop there for a second. I just want you to consider this as we get ready to read the rest of the scripture. This is about war. Now, Jesus saved you through a battle. Okay? You are in a battle. I want you to be aware of that. Anybody who thinks there's peace and safety and everything's just going to be good, there's going to be no warfare, there's going to be no trouble, there's going to be no problems, is disillusioned. In fact, I shared a scripture with someone um, just before we came here. In fact... Yeah, it's just a page over. If you read uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, and it says, uh, Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more, in labors more abundantly, in beatings more above measure, in prison more frequently, in death often. From Jews five times I received 40 beatings, minus one. That means 39. Uh, three times I was beaten with rods, once with stones, Three times I was shipwrecked, a night and a day I have been in the deep. Okay, so I can keep going. Paul, <coughs> excuse me, Paul the Apostle is saying that all these trials, all these problems have come upon me. Now, he also said that us apostles have been, um, you know, more mistreated than the body. He says, we were made poor that you might be made rich. We, were, we suffered that you might have prosperity. You know, so he talked about what he was facing for the people, but nonetheless... He, even though he might have had a magnified form of persecution in his life, persecution in someone's life is not evidence of failure of faith. Right. Your faith might literally cause you to be more persecuted. Now, the Bible says when you are persecuted, rejoice, for great is your reward in the heavenly realm. It doesn't mean after you die, then you're going to have a great reward. That's not what it means. That is not what it means. The heavenly realm is here. So as you're suffering here, the heavenly realm that's around you, there's a reward in that realm that's available to you in this world. Okay, so Paul was beaten and beaten and beaten. He was robbed. He was shipwrecked. He went through all kinds of hostilities. Problems are not a sign of lack of spirituality. Okay, so don't ever look at someone and say, well, you must not have faith. That's rubbish. In fact, anybody who would say that is, I, to me, they're fleshly. That's a fleshly judgment. It's carnal. It doesn't view things through spiritual eyes. It doesn't see things accurately or correctly. I want us to see things correctly. Now, if you do evil, evil will come upon you. The Bible says, uh, God is not mocked. What a man sows, that he shall reap. 
So if you do evil, evil will come upon you. People do evil, and evil comes upon them. Now, to the believer who goes before God and seeks out forgiveness from God, he can arrest the consequences that might come. Might not be, but he could arrest the consequences or put an end to the landslide in your life. But to the one who continues just blindly, ignorantly, thinking that it's okay because Jesus died for me and I just have a license to sin, is a foolish individual. Sin is a violation of God. It's, it's, in other words, you're living a life less than what he is, and he wants us to live without sin. So he's calling us to himself to give us the wisdom of God so he can equip us with understanding about things in the spirit and things in the natural. When you understand what you're facing, even though you can't see it in the spirit realm, then you can begin to appropriate that wisdom for life. Okay, so that's what I mainly want to deal with tonight is the fact that there's a, there is a demonic realm. And it wants to harm you. I'm going to say that again. There is a demonic realm. It wants to harm you. And there's only one way that you can subdue it and conquer it. And that is through aligning yourself with the Word of God and beginning to become a believer and a confessor of truth and a worshiper of God to put down the demonic lies. Now, the devil has no power over the believer who walks that way, but he has power over all believers and all unbelievers who don't walk that way. Our security is in the light. If we walk in the light, we are kept by God. But it doesn't mean we won't have trials, but we will not be defeated. We will not be discouraged. We will not be beaten. We will not be weakened. We will not. We will gird up with strength like eagles. In other words, the wings God gave us, we will stretch out, and God will send the breezes that lift us up supernaturally. So we're like eagles. That's how God describes us. You know, you can flap as hard as you want if you're a chicken. That's why I think a religious person is more like a chicken than an eagle. Because they're just, they're working really hard to try to get some height and altitude. But they don't get much, and then eventually they come back down quickly. But we're more like eagles. It's not about working hard. It's about using your faith to catch the God-given breezes of the kingdom that will lift you supernaturally above the circumstances others can't get to. Yeah, are we together? All right, so back to chapter 10. It says, so, uh, <clears throat> for though we walk in the flesh, this is verse 3, we do not war according to the flesh. So you got to know you're in a war. There is a war. There is a war. The war is over your worth. The war is over who you're going to serve. The war is about whether you're going to succeed or fail. Now, you can say, yeah, but Jesus already defeated the devil. Yes, amen. Can we say amen? Jesus defeated the devil. Okay, well, what does that mean for me? Well, that means Jesus proved that the devil is defeatable. Okay, he stripped him of all authority and power and rule and dominion. That's true. Okay, so if we were once under Satan, under his power, and now we've come under the power of Christ, we ought to obey Christ. A kingdom means there's a king, and there's a ruler called a king who's over that kingdom, and the people live according to his word. When you're in the kingdom of God, you live according to the word of Jesus Christ. When you don't live according to the word of Jesus Christ, you are sliding out from under his kingdom, and you are exposing yourself to be flanked by a defeated enemy. Now, I want you to know, you say, well, Jesus stripped the devil and defeated him, so... uh, you know, how can he get to me if that's true? Well, if you don't have to be of a spiritual bone in your body, just watch the news to see whether or not the devil's real. He's in every level of society, in every level of the world, working in corners everywhere he can. Wherever righteousness doesn't rule, he's ruling. And where even where righteousness is ruling, he's trying to burst out with wickedness and evil and all kinds of schemes and plots. It's real. 
So you think, well, how if Jesus defeated him and stripped him, then why is he available? It says because Jesus stripped him and defeated him in the heavenly realm. In Aranus. In the kingdom of God, Satan was totally stripped of all authority and all rule. Legally, he has satisfied, Jesus has satisfied all the consequences of Adam's sin and thrust the devil out. You can read it in Revelation chapter 12. That the enemy was kicked out of heaven. And it says there, woe to those of you who are in the earth. You understand? So he was thrust out of, not the planet, out of the realm of light into that realm of darkness. He's been imprisoned in this realm of darkness. Darkness is equivalent to ignorance. If you live ignorantly outside the will of God, then the devil's in that ignorance, and he likes to prey upon people in ignorance. That's why a brand new believer in Christ, though he's brand new, saved, and loves God and everything, he doesn't have much knowledge or truth, therefore he wanders into darkness and gets in trouble all the time. Can I say amen? Jacob. Yeah, that was, I remember your, I remember your first year. But, but look, a miracle has happened. Yeah. You are a walking miracle. Because, so you think, well, how did God get Jacob free from all that rubbish? Well, Jacob listened. Jacob applied. Jacob walked. Jacob failed and then went, what did I do wrong? And advisors and, and coaches and pastors said to him, well, it's because the devil's trying to use this against you. This is how you do it. And it showed, we showed him the word of God. And then he went, oh, right. And he self-corrected. He put his foot instead of there, he put his foot over here. And then he put his foot over here. Pretty soon he went from walking that way to this way. And all of a sudden the favor and blessing of God started prevailing to the point it produced Julia. Julie. Uh, Julia, yeah, okay. I got to be careful with that name. I get in trouble. Yeah, so, you know, he, he produced Julia. And now they're married, and now they have wholeness, and now their kids are going to grow up without all the trouble he grew up with. Yeah. You see, the curse is broken. How? By cooperation with the king of glory, with walking in the way that the Lord has, and not in the way of the wicked one. But if you continue to walk after evil, you will reap evil. Thanks for being my example tonight. All right, for, so, so it says, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. So in other words, there's a, there's a way to win and there's a way to lose. If you try to fight the devil in the flesh, you will lose. He will beat you every time. Why? Because he's a master in the flesh. He is a master in the flesh. Can you say he's a master in the flesh? He's a master in the flesh. So I don't want to fight the enemy in his favorite realm. I want to fight him in the place where I'm strong. In spirit, I'm strong. In the flesh, I am weak. So the Bible says, according to spiritual powers, we are weak in the flesh. But in the spirit realm, where Christ has purchased our salvation, and where we are sons and daughters of God, we are strong. So we got to walk in the spirit and not in the flesh to fulfill the desires of the flesh and be destroyed. Okay, so here it goes. It says, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not earthly. They are not fleshly. They are not of this natural temporal world. But they're mighty in God. Where's your weapons? In God. In God. So our weapons are in God. You can, will never find a weapon of God in a complaint. You will never find a weapon of God in a negative thought. Weapons that are spiritual that will help us are in God. They're in God. All right? So we got that. It says, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty in God. For what? Pulling down. Can you say pulling down? Pulling down. All right, so it sounds like a war, sounds like a struggle, sounds like a struggle. You know, when um, Ronald Reagan said, Gorbachev, you know, he says, tear down this wall, right? And they had the wall separating the east and west and, and, and Germany. Why? Because the Russians came down, 
and the Americans came across, and the British came across, across in World War II. And what happened is the Russians beat us into that part because we were allies with them. And immediately they try to set up and take over that part of Germany and make it part of their own Soviet Union. And they, they had debates in that hour about what they should do with the land, and there was some battling over that issue that they just stole all that property, uh, where the rest of the countries uh, started to, re to restore Germany and build it up to become a nation that could be part of, uh, of the world economy and part of the whole system of the world. But the Russians stole eastern Germany. And what they did was build a wall to keep the people in. They actually had to put the army on the, on the border to keep the people from bailing out because the people didn't want to be a part of it. They wanted to leave. So they built this big wall and then put armed guards and tanks and everything along that wall to keep the people in. And so eventually, through all the Cold War and all the problems and all this stuff, one day Ronald Reagan, our president, said, tear down this wall. Isn't that amazing? I know ministers who were going there before that, and they, God says, go to the wall and pray at the wall and prophesy over the wall to come down. In fact, what's his name? Uh, Dale Gentry. Yeah, Prophet Dale Gentry. He was telling us, we were at a conference, he was saying, God just spoke to me. He said, get on a plane, go to Germany, yeah. and go to the wall and prophesy over the wall. He was like, really? Yeah. <laughs> so he said, I got on a plane, and I flew over there, and as I stood at the wall separating the Western Germany from the Eastern, from the Western world, from communism. Right. And then the Lord says, prophesy over that wall to come down. Yeah. See, it all starts with a word. And he says, you come down, wall of separation. And then as he's prophesying, then the world leaders got together and started speaking about it. And Ronald Reagan says, tear down this wall. And because we had defeated them in economic situations, they were at risk of l losing favor with the rest of the world. So they decided to succumb and allow the wall to be pulled down. Can you say, pull down the wall? Do you know how much work it took to get that wall down? Yeah. The first people, man, they were bashing that thing and smashing that thing and hitting it with different uh, sledgehammers and bulldozers and everything. And eventually chunks of it started crumbling and the people were throwing it down. And the people on the east side were especially excited because they were being liberated from their captivity. But they had to tear down that wall. Yeah. Are you with me? Yeah. Now there are walls in your life that are erected illegally by the devil. But only you can go to the wall and begin to prophesy to the wall that you are coming down in my life. You got to prophesy. I'm telling you something. You might, I might as well be prophesying to you right now. Because I, this is like a prophetic thing coming out of me. What God's saying to you as a church, he's saying prophesy over your strongholds. Prophesy over the walls that are trying to stop me in your life. Prophesy over those, those shortcomings in your life. Tear down that wall. And so it says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not tanks. They're not swords. They're not weaponry. They're not some bazooka or some kind of jet or some kind of military invention. They are not from the natural realm. The weapons of the believer's warfare are mighty. In God. It's the prophetic voice. It's the voice of praise. It's the voice of agreement with God that tears down the wall. So we got to tear down walls with our, with our tongue. If your tongue's building the wall, then... So you're complaining about your life. Here's what you're doing. Passing mortar and blocks to your own bondage and destruction. Just go ahead, keep feeding me the mortar. The devil's up there going, yeah. I just build it higher and higher until pretty soon you can't see over it and pretty soon you're cut off from the promised land. And a lot of Christians live behind that wall. I refuse to live behind that wall. I was prophesying all day today while I was destroying natural strongholds about the prosperity of this house and about the fact that we cannot be stopped or held back by anything. Praise the Lord. We will not be stopped. 
So what are you going to do? Well, Satan has been bound in the spiritual realm by Jesus. Cast to the natural realm. So he's here. You can't see him, but he's here in this realm. Talking, whispering, speaking, sending demonic trouble into your mind to cloud you, confuse you, hurt you, destroy you, limit you, and wall you in. Well, what am I to do? I am to use my mouth to agree with the Almighty whose kingdom I'm a part of. I am an agreeer with him. I said today, Satan, get your hands off of the blessing of the church. You will not hinder us. And I summons the blessings to come upon this house in the name of Jesus. All day, just kept in my heart and in my mouth proclaiming that all day today. Now, imagine if all of us started doing that. I don't know how many times today I said, Satan, you get your hands off of the blessings of my life and off of my family and off of my church and off of our prosperity in God. Imagine if every one of you started taking authority over that devil because he's here and you're not building the wall and you're tearing down the wall. What does that mean? As far as the wall I can see today, I'm going to rip that down. I'm not going to worry about the rest of the wall I can't see yet. But as I start to see it, I'll tear that down also. I start cooperating with the king of glory, and pretty soon the wall is down, and the blessings are flowing. I don't know. I think I'm, I think I'm prophesying to you tonight. No, I don't think. I know I'm prophesying to you tonight. So he says, he says, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for the pulling down strongholds. Now, we, you know in the Greek, I've told you this before, the word strongholds in the Greek means house of thoughts. Now, we, we've ministered to you many times about the fact that the word demon, D-O, it means distorter, twister. In other words, in, in fact, the word demon, part of the root of it is knower. You know what's really funny to me? I hear in Christian circles all over the world, they all say it. The devil doesn't know what you think. Demons don't know what you think. Where'd you come up with that? It never once in the Bible says the devil doesn't know what you think. In fact, he knows what you think so much. Have you ever noticed how you're just going along and he'll insert rubbish straight into the mental conversation you have with yourself? You think. And you don't even think. You think, oh, that's the devil. He's watching what you're thinking. Demon means knower. So I, I just reject the issue that God's the only one that knows what you're thinking. Uh, in fact, what scares me sometimes is I really just think the whole spirit realm just sits there and watch our thoughts. <laughs> well, I know that that's terrifying in one sense, but it's very liberating in another. Because pretty soon you start cleaning up your act because you don't want to make a fool out of yourself in front of all the angels. You know, it says there's nothing hidden. (laughs) It will be revealed here, but it's already visible there. So um, did you ever, I don't know, this thought came to me during worship. Did you ever see, like, if we had a great big magnet right now, and we had a bunch of steel blocks all out here, and I put the, you know, if I turned that negative post like that and start walking, and I'm just leading with that. All this stuff would start to, you know. But you know what? You can just turn it over to the positive side. And it repels. Do you know what? I noticed some. Every believer in his tongue has the ability to repel or attract. Repel demons and attract angels, or attract demons and repel angels. Which one are you doing? Well, here's how they see it. You're living life, and out of you is coming negativity, and the angels are pushed back because they're attracted to the praises of God. They're attracted to the truth of God. In fact, they're confined, their whole activity is confined to the word of God. 
But demons have violated the Word of God, and they don't care about the Word of God, and they're attracted to every ungodly, wicked thought or thing that you think, and they just come up around you like crazy. Right. Is that true? Yeah. yeah, so you are either drafting angels or you're drafting demons. So this thought came to me today. This is what God said to me. Those who minimize the operation of demons are already being manipulated and abused by them. Those who deny or minimize the operation of demons are already being manipulated by them. They're already being manipulated already, right now, right now, right now. You don't have to wait. They're already. The fact that they don't acknowledge God's word puts them on the negative side of the equation. The Bible is filled with demonic talk. Like Acts chapter 10, verse 38, it says, God anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Isn't that exciting? Yeah. Isn't it exciting that Jesus was anointed by God? Remember when David was anointed by God? The enemies of Israel were prospering. Then God anointed David, and David rose up as the great warrior king over Israel, and then they started defeating all their enemies. I noticed something. When the anointing comes on someone, they start to win and not lose. Okay? So when the anointing comes on you, sickness gets repelled, poverty gets repelled, and all kinds of demonic thinking gets repelled, and you start to walk in truth with greater strength and ability. All right, so... God anointed Jesus. So you saw how God anointed David, right? Yep. And now God anoints Jesus. That's right. So when God anointed David, David got out the sword and he raised up an army. And they, you know, any 10 of them could take on any thousand of the enemy. Right. In fact, sometimes David took a thousand by himself. Yeah. In fact, what was that one guy? Israel was running from their enemies. And this hero of David's, one of David's men, thought, what am I doing? And it says he turned in a field with his sword. And 800 men fell in that field. And, and they had to pry his fingers off his sword because it was fastened quickly to the sword. He was anointed to kill. <laughs> let it be. Now, you might not think that's true, but God anointed that man to kill the enemies of Israel. So it's interesting. Old covenant, yes. Vengeance is mine. And the Lord poured out wrath, not according to the grace of God in Christ, but according to the law, which found them guilty. So therefore they were all killed. 800 men, one man. But then God anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth with this Holy Spirit and power who went about killing people with swords. No. Who went about doing good. And healing all who were oppressed by the devil. Yeah? Okay, so the anointing came upon Jesus because it's a new covenant. It's not according to law, it's according to grace. When the anointing comes upon a person of grace, devil oppression is broken. Not just in you, but in all those you minister to. It says, right, it says, Acts chapter 10, verse 38. It says it, right? How God anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil. Can you say oppressed of the devil? So what did it look like? So let's just try to make a movie of this. Here's Jesus walking around with his robe, <laughs> stopping the wind and, you know, feeding the people. <laughs> But over on this other end of town, the devil is oppressing people. He's giving them noogies and punching them out, pushing them down, walking on them. When's the last time you saw someone oppressed of the devil? Devil oppression is not physical abuse. Devil oppression is mental anguish and attack of the mind. I called someone who was out of town Oh, was it yesterday, the day before? And they were really struggling. They were going through a hard time. And they said to me, Pastor, it doesn't make sense. It's like a barrage. It's like waves of trouble in my mind. I said, Satan, take your hands off of the blessing of this man right now. 
I release the angels to minister to him right now. In Jesus' name, you're a man of God. You're a warrior of Jesus. You are not a victim. Rise up. Begin to praise God. Turn the tables on the enemy. And he was like, whoosh, he went through the roof, you know. And then pretty soon it was two of us going wild for Jesus. But somebody's got to believe. Someone's got to believe. It's more than carnal people. Our battle is now with flesh and blood. But it's with spiritual powers and principalities. Do you know, you got to realize you're in a war. Can you imagine Israel? And they didn't know they were in a war. People kind of wander into Jericho. <laughs> Their heads are flopping off. They think, what the heck's wrong? We're all cut up. What's going on? You're in a war, people. It would be so stupid to go into war without your armor, without your weapons. Can we look at that together? First, first, first let me finish this. It says, um, verse 4, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Can you say they're not? not. See, it's not people. Yeah. Everybody you blame for your problems is people. Your problems are not people. Right. Can you say my problems are not people? Right. They're not carnal, but they're mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. Casting down, can someone say? Imaginations. Imaginations. And every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Can you say knowledge? knowledge. And bringing every thought, can you say thought, thought. into the captivity yeah. to the obedience of Christ. Okay, so we got imaginations, knowledge, and thoughts. That's right. Imaginations, knowledge, and thoughts. That is why the school systems are trouble. This is where the problem in the school systems are. They cooperate with false knowledge. Sometimes it's in private schools too. And they co cooperate with, with false knowledge. Knowledge is critical. It arms a person with what's true or false. If you think you came from evolution, then God is not your father. You're an evolved thing that has come through many years and become what you are, and you're going to perish in something else better than you. It's coming later and later on, and you are nothing but something that's going to be um, dispendable. Right? But if God made man and God birthed a spirit in him, then something out of heaven came inside of us that is eternal value to God, and you matter to God. And when he spoke the world into existence, you speak out of the same spirit, and you can create as well. We have the same spirit of our Father. The spirit of Jesus Christ is inside of us now. And what are we going to do? Bottle it up, put our mouth over, our hand over our mouth, and not talk? The devil's beat me up. Oh. Get the hand off your mouth. How are you going to do that? you got to deal with imaginations, knowledge, and thought. That means you better be educated with the right ideas. You better know that God created this world. You better know the whole world is going to be standing in front of the judgment seat of Christ. You better know that your life counts for something and that the devil is beneath your feet if you're in Christ. You better know that the weapons of your warfare are not people-oriented or nature-oriented, that they're mighty in God. You better know that when you praise God, you tear down the enemy's camp. You better know how to do something about your situation, otherwise you're going to become a burden in your situation. I'm not yelling. I'm just yelling. <laughs> so it says casting down these things. Casting down. Pull them down. Pull down the wall. Come on, somebody say, I'm going to pull down my wall. Pull down the wall. If you're, going, if you're in a fight and people see you in, your, in a battle, don't think that that's not spiritual. That's very spiritual. I'm battling all the time for people. I can't tell you how many marriages we've been saving lately. Yeah. Constantly. It seems like there's marriage after marriage after marriage. Outside church are coming in and, and God's healing their marriages. Why? Because we know something. We know that their problem is not each other. We know their problem is actually spiritual in nature. We know that if they're not born of God, filled with the Spirit, walking according to the Word, and putting down uh, arrogance in the flesh, then they're going to be a bad mate for life. 
But once they begin to serve God and serve each other according to the word of God, then they become strong and servants of one another and they succeed and win. That's spiritually discerned. I had a guy call me today from New Jersey and he says, Pastor Chris, you know, this AA place. Because, you know, they helped me out. I was on drug addiction and alcohol and all this stuff. And look, I'm not complaining in the sense that they helped me. When I was down, I couldn't get out for years and years and years. I was under addiction. I said, how long have you been born again? He said, six months now. And I said, what happened? Because I found out who I was in Christ. And they want me to confess something else. And I don't want to confess something else. I want to teach people where true freedom comes from. Because they helped steer me up. They, they pointed me towards a higher power. They pointed me towards, towards a higher power, and I found Jesus. But once I found Jesus, I started learning that I'm no longer what I used to be. I'm a new creation. All things have passed away. All things have become new. I'm not an alcoholic anymore. I can't confess it, and I don't want anybody to confess it. I said, bravo, son. At six months old, you know more than most preachers on the planet. See, we are a part of raising up a new generation with a new understanding. Because they're armed with spiritual understanding, which is a weapon to do something about your circumstance. You have trouble with your spouse? Look to God. You don't know how tough they are. You don't know how tough he is. You get an arm wrestle and match with God, you lose. Just sick him on them. Turn him loose. You think, well, I've been doing that, and I don't see any change. All from the inside out, brother. From the inside out, my sister. Believe God for that. Don't cast away your confidence. It has great reward in the Lord. Continue. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Now, another word came to me today was focus. When you don't see clearly, you see blurry. And I, uh, this word hit me today that God wants his people to see him in focus. When, when your image of God is blurred and you got this mismatch mash of problems because you see him wrong, it's important to see God correctly. People think on this one camp, God is a God of love. And this other camp, they think God is a judge. And both camps see him incorrectly. He is, if you put him in focus, a God of love who would judge everything that's outside of him. But it's both. They never say, well, God is a God of love. And then people are going, oh, he's just, oh, she could, she No, that's a God of affection. He's not a God of love without being a God of judgment. He's just. God's justice is part of him. He doesn't lay his justice down. He satisfies it. It says in Isaiah, right? It says in Isaiah, I will make my justice rest. Because I am a just God. He will never set aside his justice to accommodate wickedness. He never does. He's a just God, but he's a loving God. His love will find a way to reach you if he can. But if he can't reach you, his justice will find you out. But all those who submit to Christ and love Christ and receive the love of God, they are hidden in Christ, and God can't find them out because the blood of Jesus cleanses them from all unrighteousness, and his justice concerning them rests. But if you just present God as the God of love, who is going to fear him? And that's why you sin so much, because you don't fear him. I'm not saying you. That was just a generic statement out to the world. Because in this region, we're not like that. Look, if you're in Christ, your sins are covered. It doesn't mean they're covered so you can keep doing them. See, there's an attitude inside the believer. This is the simple truth of it. You say, well, when am I accountable for my sins and when are they covered? The moment you stop caring when you sin, you're accountable. But the believer who really doesn't want to sin and is really looking to God for wisdom to get out of his sins, 
This believer, his sins are all covered. Why? Because he keeps pursuing the Savior. He's pursuing the Lord. He's not pursuing his own agenda. He's not pursuing his own purpose. He's pursuing God. But the moment you get comfortable with being sinful, judgment is waiting for you. And I think the fear of the Lord is not just reverential fear of God. I really believe it is real. This is the one who loves me and saved me, did everything to rescue me, and does not want to lose me at any cost. But if I do walk away from him, then he's the same one who terrorized the people in the Old Testament. Is this scripture true? God never changes. Is, is it Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever? So God's the same, never changes. So is your loving God the same God that destroyed those nations and killed all those women and children and all those people? Oh, yeah. The one that you embrace and love is the one who destroyed. And he changes not. He is exactly the same God he was then, now. You think, then why should I love him? Because he's the God who destroyed them is the God who also loved those who cooperated with him. And then in his love, he found a way to satisfy his justice. His mercy triumphed over his judgment. How? By sending Christ to die for our sins. So the loving God, who's just, who will kill and wipe out nations if he has to, found in Christ a way to circumvent our sins and put them on Christ and remove them so that we can walk free from sin and come to Christ and be changed. Yeah. Yeah. But he is exactly the same God who did all those destructive things back there. So your father who loves you is the one who destroyed them. So what's the difference between then and now? Covenant. Oh, praise God. Because he has satisfied his justice in Christ. Outside of Christ, his justice is not satisfied. Now there's, I, I quote it Sunday, I told you, there's a scripture that says, um, those who believe will be saved. Believing is not thinking. Believing is motion. In other words, it's a faith action. You believe and therefore you walk. Uh, those who believe, take action, they shall be saved. But those who doubt or Remain in unbelief, it says, are and will be condemned. It says that in the New Testament. So that's why I want to feed myself with raw material. I'm in a war. What's the war about? Demons want me to disobey God. Demons want me to be independent. Demons want me to do my own will and not the will of God. Demons want me to say I'm free to do whatever I want to do and no God's going to control me or no one else. Demons want me to have a Western world mentality that says, I'm my own man. I'll be with whoever I want to be with. I'll do whatever I want to do. I don't have to face consequences. I make my own way. Now, those words all came from demons. But God sits there and lovingly tries to draw that person into his grace. So they get them in Christ so his wrath and his justice doesn't destroy them. Aren't you glad his mercy triumphs over his judgment? Well, what that means is you could sin your whole life and his wrath is hot, but his mercy's still there. I mean, at the last hour of your life, you can say, oh, God, forgive me my sins. His mercy triumphs over his judgment and takes you home. All right, now I thank God that his mercy triumphs over his judgment, but I'm not dependent on my state of mind in the last moments of my life. Demons are real. It's going to take a couple more minutes. All right. Um, it says in Ephesians 6, yeah. Please take this scripture. This is in the Bible. Verse 12. For we do not wrestle. Sounds like a struggle. Sounds like a war. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Now, flesh means the natural man, and blood means family. 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 Most of you need to hear this. 
We're not wrestling with mom and dad. And sissy. And bro, bro. Now, I had nine other brothers and sisters, so I was doubly possessed. But it says, where we do not wrestle against flesh or against family, but against principalities. That means rulers. Against powers. Against rulers of darkness. Of this age. And against Spiritual, hate to say it, hosts of wickedness. That's what it says. So we're struggling with, wrestling with, grappling with, and you can measure your life whether or not you're succeeding in the struggle. Sure. Just take a look at your life. Do I honor God first above all else, or am I ashamed of my faith in Him? Do I put Him first? Is He the first component of my life? When I wake up in the morning, do I consider God? When I go to work, do I consider God? When I'm thinking about a raise, do I think of God? When I'm having trouble with my neighbors, do I think of God? When the bill collectors come, am I thinking about God? When I get sick, do I think of God? Or in all those scenarios, do I think of everything in the natural? Little stupid neighbors, I'll put up posted signs, they won't come out of my land. I had that thought hit me. <laughs> I, I got to be careful what I say. <laughs> and, uh, but, you know, things can happen, and one thing leads to the next, and they're cutting your forest down. <laughs> one thing leads to the next, and they're building a racetrack on your property. <laughs> you know, and then one next thing leads to and you're like, what the heck? You know, and then you, you can get carnal. Or... You can say, Father, thank you that I'm a man of peace and I'm not squabbling over 10 feet of real estate that I won't own eventually. And I'm going to have peace in my heart. And if I have to deal with something, then I'll come without angst, without evil, without premeditated demonic distress. I don't know why your kids are on my property tearing it up like that. Hmm. You ever seen those kind of people? Maybe you're one of them. But I refuse to let a demon control how I talk. Wouldn't this be better? Hey, how you doing? Great to see you guys. The kids look healthy. It'd be really great if they weren't tearing up my property. With <laughs> oh, I, I didn't know you did. Oh, it's no big deal. Don't worry. It's just grass. It'll grow. But anyway, what can we do for you? What if we actually lived this thing? Now, you might have to wrestle with rulers, territorial rulers in the demonic realm. That's my land. And you sit there and go, hmm. You know, it, it, it might sound stupid, but it's real. Somebody is driving down the road, they're next to you, and all of a sudden they get really close. And you're like, and you immediately look at the line, and you think, well, I'm this far from the line, and they're that far from the line. They're crowding my space. <laughs> hey, what's wrong with you? Well, what's wrong with them is they probably just were drifting off into another demonic realm in their thoughts <laughs> and started. You know, it's like sometimes demons will use anything you give them. Yeah, yeah. Sure. What will you give them? What will you give them? Then you're going to have to walk in forgiveness. You're going to have to walk in love. You're going to have to walk in understanding that it's a fallen world and things aren't perfect here. You know, every time you look in the mirror, you're going to have less here or less of something or more of something. It really freaked me out when I hit 50 and here started growing out of orifices. So you look at your toes, they think, well, that never used to be furry. Like, why is hair growing out of there? Then your nose, it starts going like this. It's like you get this new mustache coming out of your nose and out of your ears. It's like weird. I, I pull this stuff. I'm like, I don't want to look like that. I get the scissors to cut it, try to keep it clean. I think, I don't want to look like those guys. 
Do you know that if you cut your nose here and ear here, you'll look 10 years younger? So when this stuff starts happening to you, demons start talking. They use everything. Anything. Can you say anything? Anything. So you're getting old. Look at yourself. No one's attracted to you. In fact, I don't know how you put up with yourself. Like, oh man, I'm looking terrible. Oh, I got a big scratch on my face. And... Hmm? That's because I'm a deer hunter. You're not supposed to use your face to move brush out of the way. <laughs> and especially briars when you're on a four wheeler. <laughs> wow. But you could have said, well, if I was spiritual, God would have protected me from that. <laughs> Away with your pettiness, you carnal beast. <laughs> Demons want you. Demons want you. For they, we do not wrestle against flesh and family, blood, but against principalities and powers, against powers, against the rulers, against the uh, dark, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places, in heavenly places, in the eternal realm. They are attacking you out of that realm. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able, can you say able, able. to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore, can we say stand? You feel like you're getting pushed around. You're in a battle. You're not there yet. You're in the battle. Stand therefore, having girded yourself with truth, having put um, <clears throat> on the breastplate of righteousness. You know, and I could go on about this whole thing. It's an amazing how it says, gird your loins with truth. Loins? Let's go put truth through all my loins. <laughs> I am everything God says I am. <laughs> you know, it's like, what the heck does that mean? Well, it's because it says out of Abraham's loins came his children. So loins is synonymous with the reproductive area. So when it says gird up the loins of your mind, can you say mind? That means the reproductive area of your mind. Your mind is like a great studio that Steven Spielberg would love to have. We don't have to wait for staff, for costumes, or anything. We can just sit there and think, and it's all there. Manifesting. Whole movies before us, right? So your mind produces product all the time. Right? Right? So you just go home tonight, don't do this, but watch a really, really scary, horrifying movie, and I guarantee you for the next two or three days, when you go out in the dark, your mind will invent sounds and things, and you will feel a certain, like, you know, I, because I hunt and stuff, and I go out in the woods, and sometimes I come back in the dark, and I like watching hunting channels, and I watch the bears, and... And I watch the creatures, the bobcats, the mountain lions, and all that stuff. I'm aware what's out there. And then I heard the other day in Castle Creek, a mountain lion went through. They got pictures of it in Castle Creek. That's pretty close. Well, they had to come through here to get there. <laughs> you know? So anyway, so I'm aware of all that. Sometimes the Bible says the increase of knowledge brings sorrow. So I'm like, well... I know there's owls. They could be swooping down thinking my hair is some kind of an animal. <laughs> He's like, well, that's impossible. Oh, no, it happened to me. My brothers were walking behind me. You were there, right, Bob? And, uh, and I was walking through the woods, and must be my head looked like something bobbing through there. And this bird came down, and he went talons out. He was just about to grab me, and they yelled. And I went, what? And he went that way. And he just missed my head, and they were like, get out of my head, get out of my And I was like, what? I never saw it. It was guys. What'd you see? He saw it. He was ready to sink talons into the back of my head. That would have been something. Now you know that law 
about not killing praybirds, that bird would have been dead. <laughs> I tell you, he would have had his neck twisted right off. Oh my gosh. So, but I'm aware, I'm aware of these things. So you're walking through the woods. What's the devil going to use? What you know. So he knows he sees what you're thinking. I'm like, I wonder if that's a bear. Is that a stump? It's not moving. And then all of a sudden, he started pushing images, ideas in your mind. It will use anything to attack you, but you've got to be able to take every thought captive. We're going to go broke. We're going to go broke. And the devil's saying, you're going to go broke. That's it. Imagine, just picture Moses. Picture him, right? He leads the children of Israel out of bondage. He's the great leader of the children of Israel out of bondage. Isn't that wonderful? And he comes to the Red Sea, and the people start complaining. We're dead. Oh, my God. And here comes the chariots and the armies. And they're, oh, trapped. And how many times have you thought it when you're in this situation? Oh, no. What was I thinking? Why did I think I could do this? This is crazy. How did I get my Who told me to believe this? Oh, my gosh. We're all going to die here. Demons were attacking Moses' mind. But something inside of Moses remembered the burning bush. Something inside of Moses remembered. You understand? They start remembering stuff. That Abraham saw the burning bush, his forefathers. He started remembering stuff. And Moses started coming to the place of faith. He came to the place of faith. Something in him. He had to stir it up. He had to get a hold of it. He had to remember what his forefathers were promised. He had to remember the burning bush he saw. He had to remember how he, how he brought the children of Israel out of Egypt. He had to say it. Oh, God, you told me that you would help us. And he took his rod and smote the waters, and the Red Sea opened up. Now, you're standing against the Red Sea, and your armies have got you up against it, and you think, this is it. I'm dead. I'm going to go broke or my marriage is going to fail, or something, because there's nowhere to go. Yeah? Well, there's a staff in your hand. Part your sea. God didn't part the sea. Moses did. People don't believe that. Moses parted the sea. God will always say to you, what's in your hand? What do you have? Sometimes people go, oh, there's not enough money. All right, well, then what you have is a seed. Sow it. You want to really destroy the enemy. Take not enough and give it away. And see the salvation of the Lord. I have so much more for you. We, we have to win this battle. Those who minimize the operation of demons are already being manipulated and abused by them. That's what God said to me today. Not me. No. That means I'm going to silence my tongue from speaking evil as often as I can, whenever I see it. Or someone near me, like Marge, will tell me, hey, and I, oh, right. And I'm going to cooperate with that and say, right, thank you. Mm, mm, mm. You still don't feel like it. You still don't feel like it. But the truth is, I'm not wrestling with people. I'm not wrestling with mom and dad's demons. I'm not wrestling with the natural in America. I'm not wrestling with world problems. I'm wrestling with principalities and rulers. And I need to cast down every imagination, every bit of knowledge that's false, and take every thought captive to the knowledge and obedience of Christ. Can you say amen? amen. Can we stand as we pray? <clears throat> Thank you for hanging in there tonight. Father, we just want to give you thanks for your word tonight. And, and this is true. I have seen it, Lord, in my life that this thing is true. Whenever I trust you and confess with you and pray and rejoice with you over things, even before the victory comes, I've always seen it come. I've, you've never failed me. Your word, in fact, I say you cannot fail. And therefore, I cannot fail if I'll just walk with you. Father, help us to perceive the battle we're in. Help us to realize it isn't people. It isn't whether the boss wants to give me a raise. It's about whether or not you favor me. Increase comes from the Lord. Promotion comes from the Lord. Father, 
help us to put all our trust in you. Help us to make a move. If we're at 50%, we want to go for 60. If we're at 60, we want to hit 80. Lord, we want to rise. We want to go higher. Lord, I'm asking you to help these wonderful people to make a move towards faith. To begin to fill their homes, their cars, and their heart with praise. That they begin to praise God, who is the author of life. Who cannot lose a fight. Who cannot lose the battle. Who cannot lose the war. Father, thank you for cleansing heaven of all my sins. Now help me to see an open heaven. Help me to see the advantage I have. Help me to declare a binding force over the devil. Help me to curse sickness and disease. Help me to release and usher in your truth. Help me to praise when the trouble comes and to see the hand of the Lord. Father, help us to be that kind of people. Lord, I'm asking you to raise up leaders in this house. Raise up leaders in this house. Cause many leaders to rise up. Cause there to be such a a leadership of faith. People who know where to go and how to get it done. Father, we give you thanks tonight. Honor you in Jesus' name. Amen.